Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of Your Break It Down Show. Hey, today's guest is Brad Johnson, back for a second visit. Uh, we do a lot of cover a lot of ground in this episode. Brad actually is coming back with uh, Ambassador Doctor Robert Hunter, and we talk about the state and uh, intelligence collection. Now, look, Brad is a CIA station chief, so this is definitely a spy versus spy episode, and we talk a lot about intelligence and the state of reform that is needed to get the intelligence community kind of back up on its feet and focused on intelligence collection as opposed to the politicized nature that the the collection agencies tend to gain over time now this is not a partisan thing this is just how the the intelligence apparatus goes you hire the person that you think can do it best and they come from the right they come from the left and then all of a sudden you start to lose capacity because the agency is pulled in the opposite directions this is not the cia this is the intelligence community as a whole and so what Brad is saying in, in his own nonpartisan way is, hey, we've got to do a better job of this. And, and things like, look, Hillary Clinton's emails, uh, Dianne Feinstein's uh, Chinese driver uh, who's a known collector. These are problems. And that's just two examples. There's a lot of these examples in the government. So how do we deal with this? How do we tighten up the ship and make sure we're, we're plugging leaks whenever possible, finding leaks, but also getting better at gathering our own intel? That's sort of the, the idea of this. If you go to Brad's uh, profile, you'll see that he definitely leans to the right. He's, a, he's got MAGA written on his Twitter handle. Uh, that doesn't negate his expertise because he's not talking about putting forward Donald Trump's philosophy. He's saying we need to get politics out of intel. I think it's important to say that because it's too easy to dismiss somebody because you disagree with their political position. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this episode of The Break It Down Show. And if you're new to the show, look, we do a lot of things here. This week we're going to have on Brad, who's a CIA guy, a couple of Hall of Fame level MMA fighters. Um, Monday we celebrate episode 700. And that's going to be a, a, a big, fantastic show with someone that you guys are all going to love. And I guess I should take a moment and just say this. As the show expands and grows, and with the corona thing, I'm like, hey, here we go. But for Q2, I'd, I'd already committed to going to more video. And I think we're going to do our best to do almost all video now. Now, we've got a little bit of a backlog of audio-based shows, and those are going to go up. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, the show that you know and love is always going to be available, and I'm going to put those things out. But if you're into the live video thing, you'll also be able to watch live and on YouTube. And we're going to move some of the content over to the other YouTube channel and start building that out just because there's so much. Uh, we're going to be making those changes. But for right now, we're adding live video to all the shows that we're going to do going forward, if at all possible, and, but still republishing brand new shows via audio through the same traditional channel. So if you listen on Spotify or Apple or YouTube or breakitdownshow.com, it's all going to be there. It's just going to take more time for me to get those fully produced shows through. And then also we're going to improve what we're doing here with the video style stuff. That's a lot of intros. I love what you guys are doing to support the show. I see all the tweets and the shares and all those things. It's fantastic. Thank you all for doing that. I hope you guys can appreciate the upgrades. We're going to go on to this show. I'm going to spin around. Next thing I'm going to do is put everything together and push the button on publish. It should be about five minutes and you'll have Brad Johnson coming straight at you. The last thing I have to do, have to do every single time is make sure you support charity. Here we support Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. If you want to help us with that time, attention, money, tweets, shares, all of that stuff helps. Save the Brave. We focus on PTSD for people like me and my peers that have it and have gone overseas and defended and come back a little bit damaged. Um, we want to give these guys hope and give them purpose and get them back on their way so that they can turn around and help the next person behind them. Save the Brave, save the All right, I'll have this show up just in a couple of minutes. Here comes Brad Johnson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Brad Johnson, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, we're welcoming back Brad Johnson, who is a former CIA station chief. We had a lot of conversation last time, Brad, about 
the Hillary Clinton email situation and the Dianne Feinstein Chinese spy on her staff situation. And I realized in listening back to the episode, which by the way, was fantastic. And I think everybody should go listen to it. I realized when I was saying the what ifs, I told you that a secretary of state that I had access to top secret and secret on her home server, would you be interested as a station chief? And what I didn't get across in my question was, if we were in a foreign country, because you kept and properly saying that's FBI business, but we, we, so we talked around the thing and it worked. But if you take a look at that, that point of view, like if I was in the CIA and I worked under your office and we're in fill in the blank country, not America, and I have access to a member of parliament or I have access to their secretary of state equivalent, and, and I know they have classified unsecured, or I have a driver on their staff. How interested would you be in that, and and how powerful would that be for our our combined careers? Yeah, so that's that's you know multiple layers to that question and 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 the subsequent answer. Then, so uh, of course you'd be of interest, and of course your interest is going to you know fall in line with that person's access. So there's parliamentarians, or in this case, since we're speaking of a foreign government, if I'm station chief overseas and we develop access into somebody's server at home, and they're a cabinet member level person for that government. So the minister of foreign affairs, for example, or uh, their federal police, which also normally often has intelligence functions or their intelligence surface, those are all headed normally by a cabinet level position person. So the minister of XYZ. So if, if, we, if we learn that they have a server at home and they're running all their classified information through that server at home, we're to steal it all. It's just no question to it. So now kind of the second layer to that is what, how career enhancing would it be? And it's certainly not going to do you harm. There's just no question about it. And depending on the information that's on there, uh, it could be very career enhancing. Now, the, the most aggressive people out there who are collecting this sort of information are actually the Chinese, not the Russians. So now if the Chinese learned, which they almost certainly did, that Hillary Clinton was running all this stuff through a private server, and they go on there, and and we know for a fact, based on the IG reports, various IG reports that have been done, that included in that information was State Department classified, NSA classified, CIA classified. There was a, a host of documents on there from a number of different agencies. So they were able to go in there and collect all of that, make copies of it all, and take all of that home. That would be a grand coup. So whoever the Chinese officer was, intelligence officer, that discovered all of that, and went in and got it all and brought it back out for the Chinese, that was a huge boost to their career. I mean, you can see that guy got another star or, or, or was moved up through the ranks pretty quickly because that was a major coup. So it'd be the same thing. If I, as a station chief, were able to do that to the Chinese and was able to bring that information home on their high-level plans and intentions and classified information and all that, it would be absolutely a promotion and be a major, major coup. It would be a very big deal. But of course, now, once that was discovered, you can see the reaction is different. Now, here in the United States, we know for a fact that all of those classified documents were out there. And, and just real quickly referring back to how many, and James Comey in his famous, what was it, July 2016 speech, uh, where he exonerated Hillary Clinton, pointed out that there was, you know, 2,500, 3,000 classified documents on there, and that some of them were from the CIA and different places. The IG report came out and said that that was, according to the man who was exploiting the computer, that that was off by about a factor of 10. And then an, a later IG inspection said that's probably double that. So, I mean, we're talking 25, 30,000 classified documents, maybe as much as, say, 60 or 70,000 classified yeah. documents. So we know all of this based on the IG report from the FBI. Now, if the Chinese had discovered this, that their minister of foreign affairs or somebody from their intelligence was running all of these classified documents through their computer at home and the Americans came on, some station chief had gotten access to this and stole all that information. Whoever that person was that would have put that on their home computer would have been shot. I mean, they would have been hauled out in front of wherever they were and shot in the street, which the Chinese have been known to do. They've done it many times. Here in the United States, we don't even investigate. That computer has never been investigated. It's never been reverse exploited, if you will. We've never gone back to see what was in there to do a damage assessment to find out how much harm was done to U.S. interests. That's never even been done, which, by the way, is 100% inexcusable and absolutely political in nature. Nobody wants to go in there and do all of that because there's too many people protecting Hillary Clinton politically. So 
It's just one of those things that's never been looked at. And not only is it criminal, but it's something where it's almost traitorous, the fact that the FBI has never done that, because that is something where we need to know what they know and how they learned it. And that would, would tell us that by going in and looking at all of the information that they would have captured. Out of it. And there's other people that probably did it too. Everyone points out the Russians, but I, you know, it would be Chinese were the first ones in there and then maybe the Russians. But whoever was interested of any capacity whatsoever, I mean, even the Iranians would have been able to get in and get that. So it's, it's just a stunning, stunning thing to be left unlooked at by anybody. When we put that show up, someone talked about, uh, and she claimed to have a clearance. And, you know, folks that claim to have a clearance that say things that people that clearances don't say, you know, you can't put a lot of stock into it. But I think it is important, you know, because one of the things that's thought is that there was no intent there. So when the staff compromised all of that top secret and secret documentation, they didn't mean to do it. So it was okay. Um, or, or like a, some kind of creative way around releasing documents. And apparently they don't know that there's actually people responsible for saying this can be released. This can't, and you may argue with that person, but there is a person you have to go through to say, is this classified or not? And if they say that it is, then you have another conversation about whether or not it is or isn't, but talk a little bit about intent and the release or uh, lack of safeguards for classified information. Just so we're all clear about what actually happens with a with the server in a, in a yard or a collector working on your staff. Uh, sure, that's an, uh, a very important point. One thing on clearances too, there's lots of different types of clearances. There's, you know, top, top secret, you know, full scope where you have that which is the highest. You have lower levels of top secret. You have secret. You also have things like uh, law enforcement sensitive or public trust type clearances. So there's lots and lots of levels of clearances. So this person could be stating truthfully that they have a clearance and yet know absolutely nothing about this sort of thing, which is what that actually, that question sounds like that. That person either didn't know or was attempting to mislead people on the information that's out there. Here's the bottom line. Intent is completely and utterly irrelevant. It's got absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with uh, having classified information at home be a crime. And every single one of those, and keep in mind, we're, we may be talking, as, as I said, as many as, say, 60 or 70,000 classified documents. In most of those cases, now there's different classifications in those documents, so it would remain to be seen. But there were, they admitted that there were uh, CIA documents that were included in that. Those CIA documents are, are classified top secret. Now, State Department does other things. Well, most of their stuff, or a lot of their stuff, is at, produced at the secret level. So they would have lower classifications on a lot of those, but guaranteed some of them, because they were CIA origin and NSA origin, are absolute top secret. So every single one of those are individual crimes. Mm. It's not a whole thing of like one crime. Those are each individual crimes. And whoever was responsible for that, whether it was Hillary Clinton or her staff or whoever it was, starting with Anthony Weiner, is criminally responsible for that. And as I said, they could be sentenced for each one of those, say, at three months or six months or a year, whatever it is. You know, I mean, all of those could be a criminal charge. So uh, intent, and there's been many cases of this where people have been convicted and sent to jail where they leaked classified information one way or another that, that absolutely the judge and everyone, including the prosecution, recognized was unintentional. Now, that's a, an extenuating circumstance at sentencing that does make a difference. You can have a lesser uh, sentence based on the fact that, you know, you didn't mean to do it, did it, but you still did it. So you're still guilty. You're still convicted. and You're still sentenced. And as I said, this thing where Jim Comey uh, came out and said at that July 2016 uh, press briefing where he exonerated Hillary, where he said there was no intent, James Comey knows what I'm saying here to be exactly the truth. So we know James Comey was intentionally lying and misleading the American people on this because of that. He knew that intent was completely irrelevant. The fact that it's done is it. This is fairly close if you want to compare it to, say, shooting somebody in the head with a gun. You killed them. <laughs> You're guilty. Now, if you didn't do it on purpose, okay, yes, you know, it could be made manslaughter and be a lesser charge, a lesser sentence, because you didn't mean to do it. But that person's still laying on the floor dead with a bullet hole in their head. 
it, it, it's, it's very similar to that. It is a crime. You, you can argue that the degree of the crime, but not the crime itself. And, and that's precisely the same with this. If you have a classified document at home, whether it's on your server or a piece of paper, it doesn't matter. If you have it there, you are guilty. Now, if you didn't know and you could claim somebody else did it for you and you weren't aware and all of those sorts of things, okay, those are extenuating circumstances, but the crime took place. It absolutely took place. So as I said, the person who asked you this question saying no intent, uh, it's either purposefully uh, uh, stated to mislead based on Jim Comey uh, interview that he gave, or it's somebody who does know and is lying or, or is ignorant. Rather, I was going to yeah. say is the other point. They just don't know. And so they, they've heard this and they're just repeating what they've heard. That would be the base of the question is that they just don't know, have heard this stated. And so, oh, yeah, she had no intent. So therefore, she's not guilty. But that's that's absolutely 100 percent black and white wrong. And, and let me speak to this person and, and those out there who who don't understand this part of it. Like you're talking to people who did this for a living. You know, when I describe going into a skiff and what it requires just to get into that room, no one is taking this stuff lightly in that room. No one's like, I'll make some copies and walk them out the door. That's Aldrich Ames end of the spectrum. It's not the spectrum where you're caring for classified <laughs> because this stuff is really important. And this is not a political statement. This is a factual statement. When you are willing to circumvent the classification system for your own uh, ease of work. It's not supposed to be easy to handle classified. When you ship it somewhere, there are specific rules on how you move it through whatever system you do it. They have courier orders. And if you have top secret courier orders and you present them at, at like a military base, the person is required to give you the assistant you need to help you safeguard this information. There are specific, a lot of very specific rules. And just to have it show up in your garage on your server, we can't do that and expect to protect the secrets and, and the people that work at the national level. It's just, it has nothing to do with politics. If we can't protect this stuff because of someone's position, then let's not have secrets because I don't want to be out and fill in the blank country collecting on something and have my life put on the line because someone doesn't want to be inconvenienced about processing classified information. Well, that's precisely right. You made an interesting reference there too to Aldrich James for people who may not know it's going back a ways in time. Uh, he was a, a CAA employee, a case officer at the time, operations officer, who was, uh, in fact, working for the Russians and spying, eventually got caught and is in jail even now as we speak, I, I believe. That is precisely right. You raise the specter of where does it cross the line, I would say, into espionage and being a traitor to the, to the United States of America. You are disregard for the importance of classified information. And you're absolutely right. I mean, just going into a skiff, having access to the, you know, the, the computer setup where you are able to read your classified traffic and being able to print it off and how you handle it. I mean, there isn't anyone who's in that world that doesn't understand all of the ramifications of all of this. However, I mean, that said, having worked side by side with State Department for many years overseas, their culture is one that is sort of uh, anti-classified information. They don't really aren't firm believers in it, don't particularly respect it. For State Department, traditionally, you can have as many security violations as you want, and there's really not any consequence for it. Whereas in the CIA, for example, you start getting violations of that nature, and eventually you're going to get fired. I mean, you're going to get in a lot of trouble pretty quickly, where State Department, that's just not the case. It's just the culture that they live now. So I can see where this was sort of gotten away with and everybody in the State Department would look at it. Oh, well, it's for convenience. It's only classified in information. It's no big deal. That's just sort of the way they view these things. And lots of stories of knowing where, say, an enemy power is collecting information on the embassy and State Department and may have access to things going on in there. Uh, they just don't respond to that in a what I consider a normal way. I mean, I would look upon that with a lot of trepidation. It would be something I would say, you know, well, okay, we got to cut this off right away. Got to make it make somebody pay the price if we can and get it stopped. Where they look at it and go, oh yeah, okay. I mean, I would say if State Department learns that somebody on their staff in an embassy is working for the Russians or the Chinese, their reaction to that is going to be, oh good, well now we know who they are. And, you know, that's kind of the extent of their reaction. And it's an unfortunate situation that really kind of started and became pervasive at State Department, but that's expanded out. And we've seen a lot of those sorts of attitudes get spread into some other agencies. And a lot of these agencies can't be put back together and made effective and be fixed 
with who's there anymore. And it, it's a real, 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 real problem. And I think a lot of the things that we see, a lot of what you and I have talked about is, for example, in law enforcement, I'm speaking specifically about the FBI, these things that we've seen with the Hillary Clinton, the Anthony Media computer and all these things out there, what we have is political corruption. And the FBI now is a culture of political corruption. And when they're hiring, their hiring practices now are, you know, are you a justice warrior? You know, those are the sorts of questions they get asked when they're being hired. So this this cultural imperative that now exists within the FBI is that that political aspect is more important. So you don't see them all, you know, chomping at the bit. Now, there's a lot of problems within the FBI because of these sorts of issues, because some say, hey, you know, how can we let people get away with this stuff? And others are going, oh, no, no, we're justice warriors. So what's important is this. And law enforcement has to be enforcement of the laws and the constitution of the land, or what you have is a third country world. Now, I've lived and worked in other countries where the laws and law enforcement don't, aren't respected, mm-hmm. and, and they don't follow the laws. And so what you eventually have and what you see in most of the world is you're either connected where the government can be used to support you, which is what we've seen against President Trump or the FBI as an institution, the FISA court, FISA judges, all of these things uh, have been and DOJ have been used against a political rival. When you get to that point that that's sort of the law of the land, that's how things work. You get to a point where to do business, you, you know, if you're both connected, the solution is you kill each other until somebody's in charge. And that's how the rest of the world works. And that's where this is headed. And I would point out to any liberal Democrat or Democrats or somebody on the fence and an independent, you have to look at those things and understand where that road ends. If we go down this way and we don't punish these people that were involved of all of that, in all of those things, and this is allowed to continue where we're going to end up. And where we're going to end up is if you're small people, you can be stomped on. And by stomped on, I mean, you can be killed. If you want to go into business, you're going to have to pay somebody off up the chain of command. And that's why Putin is one of the richest men in the world, if not the richest man in the world. And it's just how all of that plays out. It's it's a logical sequence of events. And for me, it's completely non-political. I view it as of utmost importance that those people be tracked down and punished. And if they've actually gotten to the point where they set about to overthrow an election for the president of the United States, somebody who was legally elected, then by God, they're traitors to this country. And if you are a traitor, there's a federal death penalty. And if if it is proven that that is what they tried to do to conduct a coup in the United States of America, then they need to pay the ultimate price. The reason they need to pay the ultimate price is that people need to be taught that here in the United States of America, that's just not work. It's not going to be tolerated, not going to be allowed. Would your passion be the same for President Obama if the same thing was happening to him? Yes, I think it would. I mean, here's the problem. On the conservative side of things, it doesn't enter our head. Now, I dislike almost everything I saw about Obama. I, I, he was in bed with Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, in bed with communists and socialists. If you look at who he brought into his government, he even brought in a guy, which I find this just morally objectionable in every way. And, and it, he brought in a guy to be this, the education czar that's a pedophile. So you you bring in an admitted pedophile from an organization to support pedophilia, you know, nominate him to be your education czar, Uh, things like that that I saw him do, I find objectionable in just every way, shape and form. But it didn't even occur to me to try to stage a coup. I mean, for me, it's one of those things that you make all this information public and try to damage him politically so that everybody sees these things that he's doing and just you know, the weirdness, evil of of a lot of this and win an election against him, which is, I think, what we've seen with Trump. Because why? Well, as a conservative, what should triumph is the will of the people that you have freedom of the individual. If it's freedom of the individual, then the government serves you, the people. Whereas the opposite, if you're the socialist, communist sorts of people, which is what the Democratic Party has been taken over by and why you see the independence kind of growing, then it's the rights of the state. And you as an individual belong to the state. And so whatever the state says, whatever the government says, you all need to fall in line and obey. And we've seen all through history, I mean, all the great evil comes from the left in the world. I mean, Hitler was a socialist, uh, you know, Mussolini was a socialist, uh, Stalin was a socialist, communist, whatever, Mao, 
communist. Uh, those philosophies are such that you fall into line. And if it means that millions of people die because it's polit politically expedient to you, then that's what you do. Because that's what that philosophy is. It's the power of the state over the individual. Whereas a, as a conservative, it's the power of the individual over the state. So it's one of those things that can't really happen by design, by the way you think, by your philosophy and how you live your life. It's one of those things that just doesn't happen on the conservative side against Obama. If I had you know, been there watching this in an attempted coup against Obama, I would have been against it. I would have turned them over to the FBI to be arrested, investigated, all of those sorts of things. But it's the opposite is not true. It's just the nature of the beast. It's liberalism as it's become today in the United States, progressivism, which is just socialism by another name, they cannot be trusted to be in, in, in positions of responsibility within the government. That was one of the things I was alluding to earlier is because there's so many of those sorts of people in positions of power within the government now walking those bureaucratic hallways, it, it has to be fixed, but it can't be fixed with those people there because they'll always fight back against it, which is, is really what we're seeing now. The division that we're seeing between the president of the United States, who basically has a understanding with the people of the United States, and it's against the Democratic Party because of their socialism. People have different names for them on the Republican side, but they're of the same ilk. It's because it's essentially the bureaucracy against the people and the president, and it's the people and the president against the bureaucracy. Mm. Up until now, the president of the United States, unfortunately, has been at such a huge disadvantage. He came in as a businessman and was expecting things to go forward, uh, you know, give orders. I'm the boss. Do what I say. And, you know, look, I'm trying to do the right thing here. So work with me. He was expecting that to work. But that's never, ever going to work. I mean, by my standard, having lived in the swamp and probably you as well, I mean, we would just all look at that and go, well, that's sweet, but it's naive. It's just not going to not going to fly, not going to work. You have to bring in your own people and enforce this stuff. That's that's how the bureaucracy is here now. So the president is only now starting to to figure all of this out. And we've just seen in the last week where he, uh, in the National Security Council, NSC just sent 70 people home and Vindemann and other people that, that have been there working actively against him, he's now sent back to their parent agencies. And the news reporting, of course, is, is very poor and all this. They say, oh, well, he fired all these people. Yeah. Not one of those people was fired. No. They were just all sent back to their agency. And everybody at NSC comes from someplace else, the Pentagon, you know, NSA, CIA, wherever, you know, and they come there and work. Some of them are invited in from private sector, but, but not many. So the president, which, by the way, I'll say, I mean, that is common. Having been in there and kind of working on all of this, each time a president comes in, it does take the first two or three years kind of to figure all of this stuff out. There isn't anything really that prepares you to be president, at least in my opinion, being an observer of what they do and seeing their policies and how they pronounce what they want done and all of that. It, it takes those first couple of years, even for a professional politician who becomes president, which that is most of these guys. And for an outsider to come in, you know, to have basically started to figure all this out after three years, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, it, it, it takes some time and there's learning curve. And I, I would say he's coming out of it. And I would say leading up to election and certainly his first year, uh, assuming he's reelected, which is how this all looks right now, I would say he's really going to hit stride. We're going to see what President Trump truly is two years out into the future over these next two years. We're really going to see a lot of, of what he really is as a, as a president. This is not an endorsement of President Trump, but we have seen as we saw with President Obama, that they start to get the job better. And you're right. The NSC is a body that's in place when you arrive. Maybe you want a bigger one. Maybe you want a smaller one. Maybe you want to turn over the people. And if anybody, any president, and this is all of the presidents, has ever been a person who doesn't mind some tumult on their staff and, and wants to put new blood into things, it's this guy. So when he sends people home or back to their mother company uh, or organization, that's not in any way abnormal for him. And then if you were going to go in front of Congress and testify as a staff officer, you're going to testify against your boss. You should know before you walk through those congressional doors that you are probably not going to keep that job that you're in. You're going to do something else afterwards. Even if it was right and the president gets removed, guess who's not going to be on the NSC when the next president steps in the door? It's not <laughs> yeah, tenable. That's right. You, you've already made this decision. Vindeman already knows. His brother already knows like, hey, when I do this, we're both not going to have this job anymore. Turns out, though, and Brad, this is going to shock you. Being an 05 retired is pretty sweet. 
you can get a lot of jobs <laughs> if you stand up for a political party, which ultimately appears that that's what happened. They're going to take care of you and they're going to put you to work. And they're both still in the service. And the other thing a lot of listeners wouldn't realize about those guys is that in general, Lieutenant Colonel is the last rank you can get by just hitting the middle of the road and just maintaining a peer status. You won't make full Colonel. Maybe some of you do, but that Lieutenant Colonel rank is reasonably achievable if you have a 18 to 24 year career. I'm not saying anything about the quality of Colonel that Colonel Vindeman was or is. But the reality is, is that to get to that point is relatively simple. You haven't necessarily stood out and you can work your way into that NSC staff role. But the moment you compromise your integrity or stand out in the way that he did, your career will lose energy. And it's very likely that a guy like him, even if he doesn't go testify, it's very likely that his career has reached its apex. Anyhow, I met colonels all the time that were like, I'm never going to get promoted. They know going in, they're still doing their job, but they're not real players and they can be on things like the NSC. So when he gets sent home, you know, or back to the Pentagon or, you know, back to the Department of Army, honestly, that shit happens every single day with colonels in the army or in the military in general. There's so many colonels. You know, so right now a colonel probably got fired today or or sent to a new unit or sent off to a special staff project somewhere else. It happens constantly. And to make that some kind of news event thing, it's just silly. I, I agree. And um, I wouldn't be surprised. Vindeman now is a uh, darling of the left because of what he's done and, and looked upon as a justice warrior. And so there'll be there'll be opportunities for him. I, I'll go out on a limb and just make a prediction because of all of that that you just said. I think Vindeman recognizes that, you know, he's not going to zoom through and be a four star general in six years. So he sees, I think, and understands that his future does not remain in the military. So I think we'll see him uh, retire here fairly quickly and go off to something uh, kind of political in nature. Like, I, you know, a guy like that, I wouldn't be surprised to see him hired by MSNBC because they hate President Trump <laughs> and he'd be the perfect guy to be an announcer to come out and talk about all the evil as an inside expert on everything that Trump does that's wrong. So I would predict something along those lines for Vendeman. I would not be at all surprised to see him, him end up in the mainstream media in some way or working with some organization that's putting out public information because he's now a public figure and a dedicated, you know, justice warrior sort of guy. So I'm thinking along those lines for him. Let's get away from all that stuff because ultimately, you know, what you and I know about on the Intel side, this is much more fascinating to me. So we've talked a lot about our internal struggles and strife. We approach, you know, law enforcement collection-based Intel uh, from one direction. The Chinese are totally different in how they do this. And um, because they're communists, they tend to be more in line with what they're all doing together, where we like to careen left and right and, and change our mind every four to eight years on what we're doing. And in, even within that 48 year cycle, change our mind in a little way. They, they don't do that as much. And that allows them to build longer term relationships. Like me, I'm a tactical collector. I need to collect right now, have something for the end of the day, every day. The Chinese aren't focused like that. Let's talk about their philosophy and, and their practices. Yes, you make a fabulous point there. And on, on our side, as you say, from the operations perspective of the CIA, it's you know, you, you have tours, you go overseas two, three, four years, something like that. Average is probably two years plus a little bit. And the philosophy is that, well, you get a new fresh look at the situation and you kind of bring in fresh ideas. And so it's this constant turnover of things you bring in. Now, other services, you can talk about the Russians and the Chinese. And, and let's not forget, I mean, the Cubans have had a very, very effective service. And uh, let me use the Cubans to highlight the Chinese, if I may, because Cuba is a little island of 10 million people, but they have absolutely kicked our ass in intelligence because of precisely what you're suggesting. They have this continuity of effort. Now, granted, they have a much reduced field of enemies that they work after, and it's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place are the United States, and then it's anybody else that's out there that they're worried about. Now, a little, little known fact, I guess it doesn't really matter in the scheme of things, but the way the Cuban intelligence does it, if they recruit somebody who, say, a staffer on the Hill, and there was an arrest of somebody just like that, a young woman who was a staffer on the Hill for years and years, it was a very active Cuban agent, a Cuban-American that got recruited by them. Now, this young woman, whoever her recruiting intelligence operations officer was, kept the case for his career. 
So if it runs 20 years, that same person runs it. Now they'll build a team and different people help them. So they get to know this person and work at it. And they do have, you know, the support of the organization to make sure it goes everywhere it's supposed to go. But they have that continuity, which is also continuity of effort, which is precisely your point. For example, that sort of thing doesn't particularly exist on our side of the aisle, if you will. And the Chinese are that way too, where they have a lot of consistency where people will put in careers working in a fairly small sphere because they'll be trained in and have all the background information. They don't have to go figure out and do traces. So it's not like every two years, everything starts over from zero. It's human nature to kind of think, well, you know, before I was born, nothing existed, you know, and so you don't really look back at that. And so their intelligence apparatus is sort of built on on that, that they want that consistency and that knowledge and the experience and the background information. They want all of that. And, you know, it's just sort of the anti-hive mentality that we sort of see bits and pieces of that coming out of China, where they just, they're willing to sit there and work on that same desk for 25, 30 years, whereas the Americans just won't do it. We don't have the patience to do it. So absolutely right. It's that consistency of effort. I mean, you know, they're, they're communists. They're not going to take care of you. They don't care. But, you know, you might get some money along the way, depending on the value that you have. But they don't care where the Americans, you know, if you want to go work from somebody, you want to work for the Americans, as long as they're not giving the classified information to Hillary. So it is, it's that consistency of efforts, very important and how they hang on and continue to work on cases and the people that they recruit and being able to handle them. I mean, I would like to see the CIA sit down and analyze how ops are run that we've run in the past, how other countries run them against us and take a look at that. What we should have is a smattering of all of those things. We should be doing some, some way, some, another, all of that, mix it up all the time against the entire world so that we're always doing what's best. But now, I mean, in the CIA, as famously brought out by former director John Brennan under the Obama administration, he did away with the operation. So there is no operations cadre per se. It's not organized as operations. You know, they're mission groups and all that. And within that, they'll hire people that are supposed to do operations. But the problem with that is that you don't have that training pipeline where you just have people in that are running operations who gain that experience. It really takes about 20 years of experience working with other, you know, older guys that have done all this stuff where you come up through the ranks and learn everything along the way, which the military is famous for that. They understand it very well. You do not build, say, a combat Colonel by sending him to three courses that are two weeks each and have him pop out and be great. You know, it's the same in the CIA. You don't build those guys that go out as chief of station someplace uh, where they understand and are able to operate in these uh, securely in these environments. It just it takes these 20 years of experience to really build that guy. And then in the senior ranks, you need people who have had that operational background so that they can look at the thing and say, yeah, okay, this is a good idea. This is a bad idea. This is how it's going to have to go. I defy anyone to point out a three-star general to me that's not political. They just, they are. In order to become a three-star general, you have to be political. It's the nature of the beast day and age. Well, that's wrong. You know, these guys that come up, I mean, to get past colonel as an operator in the military is very, very, very difficult. If you don't want to be political, you're not going to get past that stage. Right. If you want to become a general and start pinning on stars, you've got to be political. Well, that's wrong. I mean, it needs to be the other way around. Having some bureaucrats and politicians in the government and in the military, that's fine. But you don't want that as the key component of your leadership. And it's the same thing at the CIA. It's the same thing at the military. We've got it bass backwards now. We've got the bureaucrats in charge with almost no operators. And what we want are the operators in charge with very few bureaucrats. A lot of this stuff can't be fixed with who's there anymore. Going back to the original premise, from my understanding of the Chinese intelligence service, they have the most operators. You know, you get back briefed, you get permission to go out along with your tasking. Even if you don't work for the Chinese intelligence agency, everybody works for the Chinese intelligence agency. So if you've got access to intellectual property or anything, you're compelled as a nation of over a billion people to give that stuff back in. But, but let's stay on the American side for a minute here first, because this is, this is an illuminating point. You take someone like me, Versus that army colonel, I cannot collect any army colonel right now. In the entire any military colonel, I cannot collect that person in a tactical situation because I did it longer than them. Like the best collectors in the military don't collect for very long at all. You don't get to season in the art of collection because you advance up in the ranks, you advance up in the echelons. 
so that you become operational, whether you're great at collecting or not. So there is no army person with more field time specifically creating relationships in a tactical environment than me. And if there is, we're peers. So, and there aren't many of us. So I'm going to go to this symposium next month and they literally have no idea who I am. And everybody has something behind their name, some organization they belong to, some letters in front of their name or whatever it is. I just have my name and they have me on a panel that has nothing to do with what I know anything about because they refuse <laughs> to accept my, my bona fides. I tell them like, I've got more field time than anybody else. Brad, this is a conference on partnering and working cross-culturally. And if I've managed to stay alive and I've been in meetings with the Taliban, aren't I valuable? But no, I am not. I, I barely have an existence there and they have no respect from these guys, but someone who's literally never been to the field or went on a deployment and sat behind a desk and God bless, you're deployed, you're doing your job. But they would all know, like head to head, they're going to defer to my field knowledge. We're terrible. We are rotten and horrible. We're probably the best in the world at this, but we're horrible at reaping the benefits of our own field lessons. You know, like your, your best agents, I don't know how long it takes to make a, a CIA clandestine collector, you know, truly elite status, but at some point they get promoted up. And, and I guess one of my questions to you is, is what do you think? Are, are you a better administrator, um, operations planner, or are you a better collector on the ground? And, and, and how can we can't find the people like me that have these fantastic resumes? Why aren't we collecting these people and working the hell out of what they know already? The CIA is now guilty of this same thing because we no longer have that operations pipeline. So, but having come out of that, where I did was a product of that and did have the decades of, of training and experience and all of that to create a full capability operator. So observing as that outsider, Army in particular, Big Green, because everybody's a little different. I mean, Navy, Marines, everybody sort of does all this differently, but now, just looking at Big Green, which I would say most of my experience with the military, most of it came out of work with the Army. The special forces groups, they're different. I would set those aside. But looking at the Big Green and how they look at intelligence and stuff, it, and is, it kind of goes back to how is somebody promoted and what gets you ahead? Because everybody always has self-interest somewhere in the mix and, and wanting to do what's best for themselves as well. The military, as you look at them, and, and a lot of the military guys I know have discussed this and you know, talk about it as well and acknowledge it, but it's, it's always, what's the shiny thing on the hill that makes me look good? And the agency suffers from this too, I'm not saying it's unique to the, to the Army. But based on that process and, and how the promotions work, and, and you're right, if you go into intelligence as a career and all you ever have is intelligence things, you'd be lucky to get lieutenant colonel, no matter how well you do. It's a tour or two max. And so that means you have guys that go in and they'll spend a 90 day deployment or, you know, maybe they'll be someplace longer where they're out, but you know, you get guys that have a couple years experience under their belt and then they go on to artillery and then they go on to, you know, whatever else, reconnaissance or something. So, you know, they, they go on to a lot of other fields because if you want to be a colonel, there's a lot of things going down that checklist you need to punch through. And of course the military, then they look at it, they got people. So they'll say, okay, We'll send 60 guys through and we'll produce these. And yeah, some of them are going to be winnowed out at the end, but at the end, we're going to have 30 of these really good guys. They think that it's to produce an intelligence officer is just a training course that you put people through. And I've actually been an instructor in some of these things and looked at, had, at some of these and had these discussions. And I've had very senior officers look at me and say, you know, I want to train my people because they hear this stuff and it's the shiny thing on the hill. I want to train my guys to the level where they can operate in the gap. I got to explain that to people because you'll understand me, but almost nobody else listening will. Right. Okay. So in intelligence circles here where you're handling a reporting source, somebody who's a spy against their country, you're living in a place like say Moscow or Beijing and you're operating there and you're under surveillance. So when you're out there, you do a surveillance detection route. You're looking at where your surveillance is behind you, how much time there is when you go around the corner and when they come around the corner behind you. That's the gap. And so you've got that maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds in which to do whatever it is you have to do, whatever operational act it is, it, you know, passing an envelope, making a chalk mark. And that's that gap. I've got this general looking at me saying, uh, or senior officer, I should say, I don't want to identify ranks, but you've got this guy looking at me saying, oh, you know, I want to have 60 guys. Yeah, well, you know, in the entire CIA, we didn't 
put through 60 guys to do that. That level of training, of which I'm a graduate and have experience, uh, which puts me in a very small group of people, you'd, you'd have years where nobody got trained in the CIA. And you just don't need that level of expertise for very many people. So it puts you in a, a very small group of people that actually needed to have that and have the experience on it. Well, why, why would he be looking at it going, all right, I'm going to put 60 people out? It's because it's that shiny thing on the hill where I don't think he even understood what Work the Gap was. But that's, that's how it's kind of viewed is you just, I have masses of people, I have money, I'm going to throw it at this, and the output at the end is going to be what this stuff that I have that people can operate at this level. But it, what it shows is ignorance up and down all of that stuff, and they don't want to hear somebody looking at them like me saying, you know, dude, that makes no sense whatsoever. That's not how this works. And it's one of those things that Big Green's just never going to be able to do well. In OSS in World War II, OSS leadership understood this perfectly. And it's why one of the many reasons that the CIA was spun off as a civilian agency and not retained. Most people don't know this, but essentially you had special forces is the sister organization of the CIA. If you want to call it this, you, you had the wet operation spin off into special forces and you had the dry operations, if you will, the intelligence collection specifically spin off into a civilian organization because that mentality of what makes a good military officer is different than what makes a good espionage master. Those two things are separate. And, and that was very recognized by those guys. If you go back and read some of the letters that were written by leadership out of OSS after the war was concluded, on how intelligence should be handled. Those things are being kicked around philosophically, how to do it. And also, one of the dangers is the amount of power that you see concentrated in too few hands. So in military power, law enforcement power, intelligence, the espionage powers, those things were all purposely separated out for very good reasons. And I would suggest, and I know we're spinning off into another topic, but I would suggest that many of the problems we're having today are because we have in the FBI uh, a huge intelligence capacity, which has taken advantage of FISA, working in conjunction with law enforcement, which is also a very powerful aspect. So you've got intelligence and law enforcement that are combined into the FBI now. When this all started out, that was not a huge thing within the FBI, but it has grown. You've had mission creep to the point where it's so powerful, that you can have those two things link up and try to overthrow a president of the United States. That's why all those were separated out. So if it were up to me, which of course it's not, I would, I would redraw those lines and make them pretty solid and, and, and try to separate those powers out because of the dangers that it provides to the future. And I wouldn't let you go back to the Army. <laughs> You'd be coming over to the operations side of a civilian intelligence agency and making that transition because that's where those capabilities belong because it creates stability let me jump in and talk a little bit about this, because when you talk about surveillance detection routes, and this is a great movie, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, that movie Spy that he does as an Israeli spy, like that gives you a sense for the constant danger that you're under. And so to be an OSS agent working in, I don't know, Vienna, and you're trying to establish something, you are completely alone. Yes, there's doctrine to give you an idea. And, and here's how you tell someone who's an operator versus someone who's a doctrinal operator. When they talk about how you write out a surveillance detection route and how you execute it, yes, that's where you start. But the mastery comes in. And if you constantly are doing surveillance detection routes and, and working on all of your surveillance things, you're going to be detected. <laughs> like you have to have subtlety. And subtlety is the craftsman who's like, yes, you made a cut this way on this chair, but understand that like this is the more elegant thing. This is how you do this day to day so you don't expose yourself unnecessarily. That stuff, as you as you know, Brad, is crafted over years and a lot of mistakes and a lot of knowledge from other operators who who help you refine your your craft. So when you hear people talking about doctrinal answers, it's like, oh, come on, you know, like what have you actually done? Who who has time for all of that? If you actually did all of the work to cover your tracks as someone who's embedded somewhere or you know undercover somewhere, you would never get any work done. All you would do is cover your tracks. We had Jack Barsky on. He was an embed agent from, from the KGB from East Germany. And he's like, that's part of what made me quit was I couldn't keep up with all of the reporting and the stress. And it's funny. I was going to ask you, you know, if a guy like me shows up, knocks on the CIA's door, 
nobody's going to answer it. Nobody's got any time for me at all. You as a station chief, you're like, this guy's enormously valuable. He knows how to talk to people in the moment. He can help us out. We should put him to work. But nobody above that, people who don't operate or haven't operated for years, they have literally no use for me and my peers. And yet, if I just went around field office to field office and just mentored from the area where I knew, I I could have a huge impact for the next 20 years throughout the CIA. And for relatively small amount of money, especially if I saved a life, you know, through through that operational knowledge, it's not a thing now. It is not, and it's 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 funny. the uh, The culture has become something that has many deep negatives with it, and the arrogance of today's culture and operations is stunning. And I I would point the finger absolutely at at former CIA Director John Brennan. He's the cause of this downfall and this lack of capability for which we will pay the price in blood at some point. This is a, a, a silly thing, but let's say you, you're getting transcripts. You're recording a conversation and you have a transcriber. So it's a foreign language probably. Well, there's a lot of cultural imperatives and differences and so on between cultures and people and how they speak. And there's a way to say things that implies one thing or another. And just writing the words down on a piece of paper, translated into English, doesn't necessarily give you the flavor of what's being discussed or how it's being discussed, or the implications, or you know, other people that are involved. It doesn't do all of that for you. But there's this arrogance now where you wouldn't see today's people go to that person that's a transcriber, because that's a lowly you know, contractor sort of person, and they look down upon all of that. Where you know, in, in my day, people were good at it, and people were bad at it, but my attitude towards those things, let me just speak for myself, is that person is uh, just a golden nugget of information. You know, if I'm interested enough to get transcriptions, uh, record a conversation and have it transcribed, if I'm that interested in something, then I want to know everything that there is that's there. That means you go sit down with that transcriber and say, okay, you know, does he love his wife? Is he pissed off at her? Is he cheating? You know, what, you know, because they're going to know all that stuff. But now what people want is those words on a piece of paper and and what they do is they just brief it up and go, see, you know, we got 12 of these. Yeah. And that's how it's done. I mean, you made a comment. I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly, but operations is an art form. It's not a science. Yeah. And that, again, is sort of one of the problems of, of Big Green is they look at everything as a science. You know, I'm going to train 60. Out of that, I'll get 30. And then I'm going to be full level able to do blah, blah, blah. It's, it's just not the way it works. It is an art form. Surveillance detection is an art form. It's like a dance. You know, you are dancing with your surveillance. And how you what you do makes them respond. If you do certain things, you're going to piss them off. Yeah. And if you piss them off, you're going to look guilty. What are they going to do? If you go out and do something that's highly suspicious, you think they're just going to go home and forget it? No. Well, they're going to look at it as and say, okay, bring on five more teams, you right. know, or let's do lockstep. Let's just put a car bumper to bumper and follow this guy around, or you know, put three guys that walk around him at all times. I mean, you have to understand that what you do has a reaction. And so what you want is to be basically nobody. You're wandering around doing whatever, whatever you do, and you do it in such a way that it's discreet. And it becomes a lifestyle. Even to this day, I, I don't drive around and walk around without looking for surveillance because it's, it's just a lifestyle. You, once you do it, you do it. It's like, you know, I guess compared to riding a bike, once you ride a bike, it doesn't go away. It's still there. And so if you get back on a bike, you know, it's just there. Well, you're driving around in cars, so... You're doing things, going places. It just, you just can't help but looking in the rearview mirror once in a while or turning around and just seeing when you have a chance to do so if there's anybody behind you. I mean, let's face it, in this day and age with all the crime that's taking place in different places, I mean, you're a little bit safer to know who's around you looking at you. So it's an interesting thing that that's there, and I wish there was more um, recognition, but it's so highly specialized. Again, I'm not sure that, that it's one of those things that's going to be fixed again until the the need is there. And, uh, you know, that means basically war or something getting close to war taking place where we start to recognize it. Oh, my God, you know, we're not collecting over here. We don't know this. We don't have a stable of assets there. When that happens, then it's all got to be relearned. All those lessons that are going to die with basically my generation, once that takes place, those lessons are gone. You know, it's not stuff that you can pull out old training manuals and go, oh, yeah, let's do this. It goes away because it's it's an art form. It's a dangerous situation we find ourselves in. And like I said, I, I, I point the finger at John Brennan personally. It's, it's a great disservice he's done to the United States of America and our national security. 
I understand how challenging that position can be and how if you have a political bent, how that's going to make the job even harder. All, all you really have done is made your job more complex and it's already a job that's damn near impossible. So someone like Leon Panetta, who's a career administrator of things, knows how to run an organization. Okay, great. He can keep things trading water and maybe it's a little more, so maybe it's a little better. Who knows? There's a lot of factors that are outside of his control. But if you come in with an active political lean to things and, and you're using your assets in a way that doesn't work to accomplish the, the best needs of all of us instead of just some of us, then yeah, you're going to have problems. Who was the last president who built a quality CIA collection organization? I've asked this question about the State Department. And one of the things I didn't realize until I was talking to Peter Van Buren, it's like, there's 5,000 of them. That's it. A brigade of people for the entire world. And, and, and we expect to have some kind of reliable, positive impact when we go to a place like Afghanistan, where you'd probably need 5,000 people in Afghanistan. So when it comes to the CIA, who was the last president to really get what they did? And I think it was George H.W., George Bush the Elder, because he, he was familiar with the organization at a level that no previous president had been. The CIA was up and running and you had a lot of the expertise that was developed out of OSS growing and being added to as we gained experience in the CIA. And that existed and was growing and getting better up until Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter had the Black Thursday where he fired a couple thousand people, a couple thousand more people walked out. And as you noted, the you know, State Department is not a, that large of an organization. The CIA at the time was also not that large of an organization. And so it was a pretty major blow. So you had both good and bad be thrown out the door, but uh, it, it changed how everything took place. And of course, you had the oversight committees put in and all this. So a great deal of the capability of the CIA was essentially destroyed under Jimmy Carter. Where it was built back up, the first guy to come after that, which was immediately on the heels of it, was Ronald Reagan. Right. Ronald Reagan then uh, reconstituted the CIA, was trying to make it good and effective and bring in the right people and get them trained up and, and get this uh, espionage cadre, the operations cadre, professional again and, and fill the ranks. Uh, George Bush, the father, who, yes, you're right, had been former director of the CIA, uh, basically inherited that from Reagan. But you had under under Reagan, his chief of staff for his election, I mean, his, his campaign manager. And when he won the election, he had that guy come over who was a former OSS guy. And that guy was made director of the CIA. So you had an operations guy come in to take over the CIA. And that's where you had that rebuilding program. George H.W. Bush, as director of the CIA, was never an operations guy. Now, he came out of the Navy. Navy tends to have good respect for intelligence operations because they all know that in World War II, intelligence collection was just such a, uh, an important aspect of winning World War II in the Pacific that they all have a great deal of respect for it. So you, you do see that out of George H.W. Bush. And, and so he did have that. But being director of the CIA, like Mike Pompeo, and George H.W. Bush and, and these different people that have, have been directors of the CIA doesn't make you an operator. And it's essentially political. And you're a consumer of intelligence as director. So Mike Pompeo was well suited in the sense that he understood what he was reading well by having been on the oversight committee before becoming director of the CIA. But he didn't know anything about operations. He's never run an operation himself, doesn't know it. He trusted other people to do those things at the CIA. But Casey, who was this you know, uh, campaign manager for Reagan, did because he came out of OSS. So he was the last guy to really come in and, and have a chance to sort of do what he wanted. Now, there was another guy that had some time in the agency that as a congressman that came in and, and uh, he basically, the, the bureaucracy had taken over by then and anything he tried to do was turned against him. He was thrown out pretty quickly. So I would say the guy, the last guy to have any impact, lasting impact to try and, and uh, build a, a cohesive operations espionage capability was took place under Casey and Reagan's days. It slowly drifted downward under H. W. Bush, but wasn't destroyed. Uh, but then in later years, all that went away under Clinton. And then you saw the the hammer fall, and it had never built back up to where it was previous to Jimmy Carter. And it was basically destroyed uh, under Clinton. All the pieces were there, which then all that was finalized under uh, the Obama years. So it's it's a destroyed organization. I dread the price that will have to be paid to get all that back. Yeah. Well, in your adversary, 
And I say adversary because not everybody's contrary. They're just someone who's looking to take an advantage. They're looking for weakness. And if you present it and they find it, well, that's what guys like I do. I'm looking for weakness and vulnerability that I can exploit. And if you give it, guess what? I'm going to put all of my resources into exploiting that weakness. So, so that's how I approach those things, you know, and I'm relentless, you know? So if there's a thousand of me out there collecting, looking for weaknesses and exploiting them, and, and, and if one of us gets lucky, guess what? We're going to put a lot of resources. Matter of fact, that army person will lose that source. And you guys will step in and really get to work with bigger money, bigger assets. So, yeah, you illustrated it well, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting about this. You want to say anything in closing? Well, I would. Uh, anyone who's interested can uh, certainly sign up for my newsletter on my website, which is intelreform.org. Or follow me on uh, on YouTube at Brad Johnson on YouTube. So uh, anyone who's interested certainly can take a look at those. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks, Pete. Good to talk to you.